Let's just say hello to Phil right now. Phil, good morning to you, buddy. I want you to hear John's poem. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Because you were in the Doing soup well. with them last week by telephone. I'm excited. With, well, yeah, I'm, I'm excited uh, for this poem, too. I heard it earlier. I said, I can't wait for this. Yeah, talking about being in the soup. How hot did you get last Monday? Yeah, Phil. Yeah, Phil, yeah, Phil was part of it. Last week when we were on the phone, I was about 68 degrees. <laughs> yeah, you were really suffering, I think. <laughs> it was a humid 68, though, Bill. <laughs> and you were more than happy to point that out. And I do not remember a lot of sympathy that you gave us, uh, Phil. You may have laughed no, at us a little I bit. It. Yeah. I felt it. Isn't it, it enough to feel it? I say that shame on Rob. And I, did, I do remember talking about that for allowing this to happen and i i think i accused him of knowing that the ac was out which is why he wasn't there well yeah we say shame on rob we shame on rob on a lot of different things on a lot of different areas but this heat last year uh, last week was really unique rob well I, I would like to uh state unequivocally that i do not own the building i do not own the place the only decisions i make is each morning when the alarm goes up at 3 20 Snooze or no snooze? That's, yeah, that's he, it. He's he's throwing Hornby under the bus, I John. Well, <laughs> I believe it was Mr. Hornby who came in on the program one day when you said something about Bill's chair, and he said, "That's my chair. My chair. I own that. the chairs, the table, the building, everything in here, and that includes the broken AC unit." You're right, Rob. It You're didn't right. suddenly <laughs> convey to me when I left for work that day. Now, without further ado, Mr. Gilstrap, the poem. are we ready? I am. All right. Do you need any music behind you? Well, something soft would be nice. But no, we can, we can, we can do it over silence. This is called The Ballad of WRNR by New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. <laughs> this is how he introduces himself to people, by the way, when he meets them. It sounds haughty when I say it, doesn't it? When, when he's in the waiting room at the doctor's office, that's how they call him to the, to the front desk. And now dedicated to Rob Mario and Bill Stubblefield. Mm -hmm. Are you nervous at all in reading this? No, I, I, I think we'll, we'll see. Ask me if I'm nervous afterwards. All right, here we go. In Martinsburg on the radio, in the mornings you'll find Rob Mario, an Italian kid from Steelers Town. His face only rarely wears a frown, though it's sure to happen if he should see someone eating a can of Chef Boyardee. <laughs> this is all true. Rob works the board like the pro he is while helping newbies learn the biz. He demonstrates a certain flair that avoids all feedback and dead air. His approach is open, honest, debonair, as he calms most guests, but not Craig Blair. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're good. <laughs> For me, Monday mornings bring the thrill of sitting alongside Admiral Bill. There's not a soul he doesn't know. His questions brighten up the show. And regular listens know the fun when he pronounces words like chrysanthemum. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even try. <laughs> On Thursday mornings comes a seersucker suitor. That's Matthew Harvey, prosecutor. His quest for justice knows no, knows no equal as he fights to rid the world of evil. A trivia buff, he likes to compete in contests that features the mountain state. A few years ago, he dodged his nader when he squeaked out a win against a smart eighth grader. <laughs> I tip my hat to the radio, to the studio crew, and offer my thanks at all, for all that you do. Colin and Spencer and Dylan and Nick, you all are ambitious and young and really quite slick. You report on sports ball and regular news. When I was your age, life was all about booze. <laughs> for decades, I've dreamed of a radio gig, talking on air about topics I dig. To Rob and Mike Hornby, who said, give it a try, I am very grateful and will not be shy about laying on compliments, offering praise. But would I be out of line if I asked for a raise? <laughs> no, I don't That's think it. you would be. There you go. Rob, you have competition. You have competition. You yep. But I didn't do it in the voice. <laughs> I could have done it in the voice. <laughs> but hey, Ferretti called that the fake New Jersey Pittsburgh <laughs> accent. <laughs> I was expecting something about the broken down air conditioning. No, no that wasn't that. No, that I, wasn't. I thought this was Gilstrap's payback. Well, very nice, John. Uh, Phil, what did you think? What would you give it as a grade? I'd give it an A plus. It was a good job. I I, I, I liked it. He's just relieved Except he wasn't really, in it. Yeah, you're pretty I, lenient. In your I, grade, I think, I think well, Phil's sucking up. He wants <laughs> yeah. a new account. He wants that New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap financial account. 
I was nervous that there was going to be uh, my, my quote of licking a horse was going to come up in there. So <laughs> it I, should I have. I gave him an A-plus because it wasn't there. <laughs> That's why I've got to give it an A-minus. There should have been some type of reference to Phil licking a horse. Uh, Phil, hey, uh, I looked up some numbers here because as this continues in the preseason, uh, these are pretty cool times for Shepherd football. Tyson Bajant, 9 of 10, 76 yards, and a rushing touchdown in the Bears game. He had a 98-3 passer rating. And Ronnie Brown, 7 carries, 19 yards for uh, uh, Tampa in their preseason game. So not only these, uh, and I, I don't know about uh, Fisher, by the way, in terms of his stats, he's an offensive lineman, so they don't usually grade in preseason uh, what an offensive lineman does. But it's pretty cool to see these Rams getting playing time in their rookie camps here in the NFL. Who knows? Maybe a couple of them will stick. I know. And, and you know, to, to Ronnie Brown's point, he had seven carries for 19 yards, and you go do the averages on that. Now, four of those came when they were just running out the clock, or three of those, I think. And so he, you know, he's getting zero yards in a cloud of dust, and that's not really something that you could gauge him on. But as I understand, because their games haven't been televised, He's been blocking really well, mm-hmm. so which which uh, bodes well for him. And he's had a couple nice pass catches, a couple uh, decent moves. And in the middle of the games when he's running, he he's getting some yardage. So that's it's good for all three of them. I, and I understand uh, Fisher's doing well, like you said, his poor offensive lineman never get any stats. But as I understand, he is doing fairly well. But it seems like an uphill battle maybe for him to make the squad. But you know, if he ends up on the practice squad, then it's a success. But as far as Tyson goes, man, he's captured the city of Chicago. Not that I'm in Chicago, but I've followed the the sports writers of all three of these teams on Facebook, and it's popping up on Google and looking for them on Bleacher Report. And uh, Tyson has for sure captured Chicago. They love that guy. And, you know, another good thing for Tyson uh, is that uh, P.J. Walker and Peterman – have been terrible. So they're looking at, you know, we got Justin Fields who, you know, they've, they've pinned a lot of hopes on. But when you look for their backup, and he's a running quarterback, and those guys get hurt a lot. So those fans and the sports writers are very interested in who the backup quarterback is, and they are all clamoring for Tyson. He's done extremely well. He's command of the offense. He seems calm. And to me, the most, my, the most impressive play – well, he had a quarterback sneak, and he came up, and he got everybody down, and everybody was set, and he got two or three yards on a quarterback sneak. Tyson's a big boy, and we all know from his dad. You know, he's a big, strong kid, and that does him well. I saw a rollout pass. It, it, it is really exciting, and I heard this morning on National Spot, uh, Fox Sports Radio them talking about Tyson. He's got he's got some swagger to him, and it it is as exciting. And they're not the first ones. You know, the only thing that bugs me about the whole thing is hearing – commentators talk about Shepard and you know they almost do it jokingly and they downplay where the school's from these three aren't the first ones you know I played with the guy that that spent some time in the NFL like on active rosters and James Roos and there's been plenty Howard Jones I remember watching him in camp and he bounced around from a few teams so it's not foreign territory but to have three of them there and especially the attention Tyson gets and it is it's really cool yeah Roots I think bounced around with the Jets for a while he was the best kicker, kick returner in, in NCAA Division II football when he played. I remember that. Uh, Ricky Schmidt, also a uh, punter, he got some time in uh, the Canadian League for a while. But these three guys, they're really uh, capturing some imaginations. And, and Bajan is playing so that in Chicago, I understand it, Phil, that they're afraid to try to stash him on the practice squad because he might get claimed if they put him on waivers. Yeah, and I think the early thought was that, hey, we'll get this undrafted free agent and we'll get him on the practice squad if he could if he could handle this competition and then kind of groom him. But now the way that he's played, you know, I think even a coach had mentioned that, man, we can't put him on the practice squad. He'll never clear waivers. When they go on a practice squad, other teams have the opportunity to sign him. And, and the way he's played, you know, and you, and you hear some, and, and they were talking about this this morning on – Fox Sports is like, well, he's playing with, against second and third teamers. Well, he's also playing with second and third teamers as well. So he's making throws into tight windows, and you still have to command the offense. Sometimes that's even harder when you've got like a hodgepodge of guys in there, some are second and third team, and, and some journeymen and so forth, and he's commanding the offense in that scenario. So, yeah, he's playing against that, but he's also playing with that. 
and has been extremely successful in both of his outings. I can't wait for the next one. I don't know that I'll, I'll be able to watch it, but I can, I'll, I'll certainly record it if it's on television. I'll find it. Yeah, I can't wait for the next one. Hopefully he gets a lot of time and can further state his case to be – they're not talking about him making a team. They're talking about him being the second-team quarterback, and that is huge uh, when you have a, a quarterback like Justin Fields who's – they may uh, he's an he's a early first-round pick. Heck, he might have been number one pick. But as much as he runs, they're, they're a stone's throw away from that second-team guy coming, coming out and playing, and that's what they're talking about Tyson being right now as a second-team quarterback. Uh, Phil, do you know whether Chicago carries two or three quarterbacks? I, I don't, and there's a, the, you know, a lot of teams now because they're allowed to carry one more player. A lot of teams will carry three on the active roster, but some will still stick with two in case they need an additional lineman or an additional outside backer or a corner or something like that. So they can carry two or three. But, you know, right now, like, like I said, the most promising thing I think for him is, you know, if you think about look at it from – a financial standpoint, P.J. Walker, if they cut him, uh, they save a lot of cap money because they had to pay him a lot. So if Tyson's better, and he certainly looks better, if he's better, he's less expensive, it makes all the sense in the world for him to be the number two. Dylan, our producer, just sent me a text that said, Pro Football Focus has graded Tyson as the fourth best quarterback of the preseason in the entire NFL so far. Which is pretty fascinating. I mean, it's yeah. preseason, so you don't yeah. want to get to it. But would you would you rather he was like the thirty second best quarterback? You know, of, of course not. You you know, he's playing well. What he's doing is he's making it difficult to cut him. And if he does get cut, he's going to have enough film now that he'll be noticed by other teams. But yeah, I I just it's gonna be hard to cut him though. Yeah, and he, man, he looks good in that Chicago uniform. He just seems to fit there, doesn't he? I just you know his his grittiness in that town. I'm excited for him. I, mean, I, I don't know him. I know his father, but I, I don't know him. But being a former Shepherd football player and Shepherd grad, and I have a daughter at Shepherd right now, it's uh, it's exciting. It's exciting for everyone. Well, when you meet Travis and then you talk to Tyson, <laughs> <laughs> Tyson does not have the same personality. <laughs> He's, he's not quite as boisterous. Uh, Phil, let's talk finances here, my man. It's a positive morning for the futures markets, but Jackson Hole is this week. And it was about a year ago at this time that Jackson Hole caused a pretty tough uh, next uh, several months in the financial markets. Yeah, and it, it kind of changed our course because up until Jackson Hole last year in 2022, we had a pretty decent run going. And I remember Jerome Powell saying we need to experience some pain, and that was the headline. And for the next six weeks, we, we had a sharp fall before recovery, hopefully because August has been so bad. You know, there's been so many – so many little things and nothing really positive that would turn us around. I'm hoping that the Fed speak from Jackson Hole can do that for us this time. We got Nvidia earnings uh, coming out this week too, but I think most importantly, probably is Jackson Hole. What we're trying to determine is number one: will there be future rate increases? But maybe more importantly, how long do they perceive that they're going to have to keep rates higher? It will be shorter or longer, and when when will that anticipated first cut come? So everything's kind of swirling around right now with that. The Fed minutes didn't give us much uh, much hope. Uh, Fed speak last time didn't give us a whole lot of hope. Uh, CPI report came out basically flat. It was a, a little bit higher than what was anticipated. Nothing shocking, and so that didn't give us a lot of hope. Uh, Moody's downgrade of some of our was it, uh, Moody's downgrade of some of our banks. Didn't give us a lot of hope. Of course, Fitch downgrading of U.S. credit didn't give us a lot of hope. So we're kind of scratching for good news so far here in August. But I would remind everyone, we went through this in February as well. And, and you know that, that is something that happens during the bull market is we have these pullbacks. As of right now, that could still say, hey, this is a healthy pullback. That is something that is a thing. That healthy pullbacks do happen. We just need something to turn us around and pull us back out. Yeah. Phil, uh, we have a lot of stimulators for the market, the PPI, CPI, earnings, even congressional action alike. Why does it appear that the market is more responsive uh, to the Fed's rate increases or decreases than anything else? You nailed it right on the head. They are. It is more responsive, and there's a handful of reasons. One is extremely boring, and that's something that we can't, we can't lose sight of is how you 
actually determine the book value or the intrinsic value of, of a stock or of a company. And part of that equation by the capital asset pricing model, part of that equation is interest rates. The higher the interest rates are, the lower the current value of the stock is. Now, we don't always pay attention to the intrinsic value. And I've, I've often, I don't know that this is a good analogy, but in, you know, we talked about the price of used cars last year. The intrinsic value of something would be if you took all the pieces of the used car out and laid them on, out in the parking lot and sold them individually, uh, how much would you get for it? Opposed to if that car was put together and it was running nicely and there was no work that needed to be done, well, of course it would be worth more once it's put together and running on the roads than what it would if you sold it by piece. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with the stock. And we don't always pay attention to intrinsic value. Just like last year, we weren't paying much attention to the intrinsic value of used vehicles. And we saw that in our personal property tax bill that everybody's been talking about this year. The, uh, but that is one of the reasons, and one of the main reasons, really. Another one is, is as values, as interest rates go up, the borrowing costs, so now our, our assumptions with, with uh, stock prices, number one, they're not as attractive. Stocks aren't as attractive when you can get 4 or 5% in a risk-free rate of return. And when we talk about a risk-free rate of return, we're talking about time deposits and, and cash-type products like CDs, savings accounts, certificates, and the like. Those are, that is a risk-free rate of return. I don't have to worry about the risk of it. But the higher that rate, the less money flows into, uh, into stock. So there's a lot of things that go into it. But ultimately, every, every stock is impacted when interest rates go higher and more so, though, on the growth company side. Now, growth companies typically don't pay dividends, and that compounds the impact of high interest rates. So the growth – that's why we see the NASDAQ being more volatile during these periods where the Federal Reserve is increasing rates, and as well they do better when they're decreasing rates because growth companies don't pay dividends and has a higher impact on that intrinsic value. But that's a huge part of it. It's a really boring answer. But that is a huge part of it. There's a lot of things that that doesn't bake into. It doesn't bake into our perception of what's going to happen. Of course, uh, a, a math equation on a piece of paper isn't going to talk much about artificial intelligence. It's, not, it's going to discount all of that stuff. It's going to discount emotion. But we do tend to run to it during these periods. And there's also a lot of mutual funds and, and investments that are based off of intrinsic value in and the in the higher the rates go the lower the intrinsic value and so they'll start to sell things based off of that but interest rates are the federal reserve the federal funds rate is a huge driver of the market and there's there's very few times where interest rates are going one way and the markets are going the other now we 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 try to we try to anticipate so it's not a a exact lineage of when rates go up markets go down and vice versa because we're trying to anticipate what's going to happen into the future which is why when the federal reserve talks we put so much emphasis on it and it's so important so <clears throat> phil shifting away from the the markets to the economy in 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 large um read an article several articles actually in the wall street journal last week that talk about the softening economy in china what kind of an impact it used to be that when america sneezed the world got a cold and now china is is getting pretty big chunk of everything in terms of the worldwide economy if their economy does starts to weaken what effect does that have on us uh, it, it impacts our sales because of our open markets and how much we sell to china and vice versa how much are they producing for us and you know that fed into the inflation narrative not too long ago because we were reopening and we were manufacturing our goods and we were shipping them about, but China wasn't because they were still closed down. So that was part of the inflation narrative because we weren't getting those things from China. So therefore, those products, we were paying more for them from other places, even if we were creating them. And so if their economy is slowing and they don't have the ability to spend money, well, that's going to impact our sales. And Apple is a really good example of that because of so many sales in China. But they're not going to be purchasing those cell phones or, or plans or whatever it may be simply because their economy isn't up to snuff or it's trailing or behind what the rest of the what the rest of the globe is doing. 
So as China struggles, everything that they purchase from other countries, they'll also see some of the impacts of that. I know you don't like to deal in, delve into politics and such, so walking kind of around the edges of that, is the time coming that we need to to start bringing the manufacturing functions back to the United States? It, in retrospect, was it a mistake to be depending so much on China? Well, on one hand, and this really isn't even a political answer, but it makes things more predictable, right? So we can't really control too much of what happens in China's economy or anywhere else for that matter. But here at home, we do have the ability to at least to some extent control our economy by the things like what the Federal Reserve is doing right now. You know, make no mistake, the reason that the Federal Reserve is increasing rates is to slow our economy, to slow us down some because of that imbalance between supply and demand. It's the exact opposite of what happened during COVID, but we have the ability to control ourselves at least a little bit. And if everything was made here at home, then it would be more predictable, and we wouldn't have some of the same fears. You know, right now we're at, we're at the at the mercy of some chip makers, right? That was a big issue with with automobiles, and it led into we were just talking about used cars. It led into some of those used car uh, increase in prices because we didn't control that. But if we control that, then those items would be more predictable. So it's not even really a political answer, but it would. Uh, make the stock market more predictable. I don't know about uh, gains and losses, but I think all investors would welcome more predictable returns. Are we seeing signs of that happening? Repa repatriation uh, of, of manufacturing? It becomes more and more uh, of a headline. And even you know, the, uh, and from the politics standpoint, you start to see uh, more and more politicians, especially the bigger the government you know, on the presidential standpoint, or they they boast that as part of a part of their agenda is to bring all of that stuff back home. So I think I think we are moving toward it because you start to hear people talk more and more about it. We hear a lot about natural resources. Uh, uh, certain things as lithium and um, and nickel and the like. Uh, is China a major producer of the natural resources? Uh, I think they I think they uh, compete with us a lot with it, it maybe not producing wise with coal but they're a big purchaser of our coal and a big purchaser so if they if they're not producing it they are a huge producer of it and you can we can't really control that so there's there's a, a, a and I'm using coal because that's where I'm from and and down in the southern part of the state but if you just simply watch KOL which is an exchange traded fund for coal and it, it doesn't it hasn't reacted the way that you would think that it would have reacted from having a democratic office to a republican and back to democrat the price of coal had changed drastically but in the opposite direction of what i would have thought anyway during those terms and a large part of that is simply because if we're not buying here then okay well china will buy it and they'll even pay more for it so we're producing it and shipping it to china so it hasn't really slowed it down but, yeah, I think uh, they, they do produce a, a good bit. I don't know how much of it we're purchasing from them, though. Phil, final minute. How do we reach you for more information? Uh, you can always reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. You can catch Phil weekday mornings at 6.38, replayed at 7.38 for two minutes on the upcoming business day. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Thanks, Phil.